Hey everyone, Dr. Tim here with Hillary for another session of Dr. Tim's Aquatics Podcast. How are you doing this afternoon, Hillary? I am doing good. It's a beautiful sunny day here. Oh, so it's summertime in uh, the state of Washington today and tomorrow. I think it's quite it's quite hot there. <laughs> it actually is. It's the humidity. The humidity is really what gets you. Well, it's beautiful down here in Southern California too. Okay, so uh, we've been to a few shows, Reef of Palooza, other things, and uh, today's topic is going to be media, since we got a, seemingly a lot of questions at the last couple of shows where people were asking about um, media, how to use it, when to use it, how do you know when it's um, worn out, does it, does it wear out, everyone's confused. So we are here to help clarify. Yeah. And I think nope. there, I think too, there might be a little bit more buzz. Um, Reefa Palooza, California, I believe, just shared a photo of our media lineup. So uh, I mean, we'll, huh. we'll have the media with us in California, but you might be seeing more of it than you have in the past. Yes, it's getting good distribution. Okay. So, so media is a broad term for. A, a lot of different things. I mean, you can think media as being the biofilter media that bacteria live on, or it can be chemical filtration media. And the big difference between those two categories would be that biological filtration media does not wear out. It's some type of an inert surface that the bacteria live on, live in, and while you might have to clean it once in a while, you really shouldn't ever have to replace it because it doesn't wear out. Whereas chemical filtration media is going to wear out. It's going, the absorption sites, and we'll talk about that in a minute, will be filled or the media may dissolve away or whatever it is, it gets used up and has to be either replaced or recharged. Uh, another topic we'll cover, uh, much easier just to replace than recharge. So uh, biological filtration media, there's a wide variety. We sell some, and generally you want that to be uh, porous, that way the, the water can get through it. If, if the media you have, whether it's natural or plastic or engineered, you know, it could be ceramic centered glass, if the water can't flow through it, then you're only gonna get the outside surface area of the media, and that's not gonna be very much. Also, if the openings or pores are really small, they're going to clog up quickly with basically uh, organics. I mean, the bacteria might start initially growing in there, but bacteria produce waste. They, they grow in biofilms and produce a extra, what's called an extra polymer substance, EPS, that sticky film that you feel on surfaces in your aquarium. And that will clog up the small pores such that the water won't go through it. And so it renders all the, the initial surface area of the media worthless because if the water can't go through it, the water can't come in contact with the bacteria, you know, the nitrifying bacteria. And that means that the bacteria can't do their work. So the first and main thing about biological media is to make sure that it's uh, got a good surface that's porous. Fine pores are not going to help you. And a lot of companies will tell you they have you know, thousands and thousands of, of uh, square miles or you know, square feet of surface area, but all of it's useless if the, back, if the water can't get to it and the bacteria can't grow on it. So you need, you need material that has... A really an open pore structure like what we sell. 
And also we sell a natural material for biofiltration because it's got a positive charge and bacteria, nitrifying bacteria are attracted to surfaces that have a positive charge. What you should do though, even though we started with biological filtration media is in the order of your filtration system, that should be the last thing. We've covered this a little bit before, but um, first you have mechanical filtration to remove as much of the particulate material as you can. And then you'll have chemical filtration, which I'm gonna cover in just a few minutes. And then the last thing is the biological filter where the nitrifying bacteria are taking care of the ammonia and nitrite in the system. So that's the order. Uh, mechanical keeps the water cleaner. Uh, if you just have a biological filter, like the old undergravel filters, you know, the substrate was on the, the undergravel piece of plastic and the, the water went down through whatever the substrate is through the plastic false bottom and then back up the lift tubes in the corner. Well, that gravel or coral was doing two things. It was serving as a mechanical filter being clogged up with organics and detritus but it's also supposed to be the place where the bacteria, the nitrifying bacteria are living, but you're burying them in organics. And that's why undergravel filters are not the best filter, they biological filter, because they take a lot of maintenance and their efficiency decreases over time as they get covered and buried with uh, organic material. Excuse me. So let's start with the first, the most common type of, let's go to chemical filters now, chemical filtration media. And the most common type is gonna be activated carbon. Activated carbon can be made from a variety of materials, bituminous coal, anthracite coal, um, used to be bone material, but that's not very common anymore. <clears throat> Sorry about that, folks. Um, and uh, coconut, coconut got very popular, but because it, it was cheap. But the issue again, hold on, like coconut husks. Coconut, no coconuts. You know the the not the husk, but the actual shell of the coconut. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and again. The, the issue is that in order to work, there's two types of pores. And I, I wrote a, a big article about this several years ago, which you should be able to download in the technical section of uh, drtimsaquatics.com. But there's called uh, macro pores and micro pores. And Activated carbon, depending upon the base material, will have a large amount of micropores or a large amount of macropores. For filtering water, you want a carbon with a bunch of macropores. If you're filtering air, then you want the micropores. And basically coconut carbon is full of micropores, so it wasn't very good, it was cheap. Uh, but it was not good for water filtration. And you really, the best is bituminous uh, carbon. And that's the type that, that we sell. And again, just like with a biological filter, and that's true for all the med chemical media we're going to talk about, is that you want the chemical media to be to have clean water. You don't want to have the chemical media doubling as a bio as, as a mechanical filter. So you need to have good mechanical filtration taking out all the particulate material. So the particulate material is the stuff you you can see floating around in the tank, the the grunge and the the specks and you know, the particles that you can see in the water, you want all that filtered out with a good mechanical filter, you know, it can be pads, sponges or something like that. Because if you have that, if you have water with all that particulate material going into the carbon, 
the particulate material is going to clog the carbon and it's going to, you're wasting your money. Your carbon pores are going to be clogged or whatever media you have is going to be clogged with the organics. The water will take the path of least resistance and it'll go around or it'll channel, which is where it basically bores a hole or a chamber tunnel through the media. And now the media is just completely worthless and you're not getting any benefit. So in front of all this material, the very first most important thing to do is to have good mechanical filtration and you need to clean that. That's your job as an aquarist. You got to change the oil filter in your car. You got to clean the you know, vacuum cleaner bag or filter. You clean your mechanical filter often in your aquarium. It'll make your biological filter media and your chemical filter media work much better. Now, activated carbon, uh, there's some controversies about that, that it causes this and it causes that, um, but eh, there's no real hard scientific evidence um, on that. Uh, I find that it's always good to have in your aquarium. What does it do? It removes uh, humic substances, so that's the, the or dissolve these are dissolved substances so your particular your mechanical filter is not going to remove things that are dissolved in the water that's the difference between particulate filter and a dissolve a filter that removes dissolved substances which is the chemical filtration we're talking about so carbon removes the the, the organics that color your water to make it turn brown the organics that can start to cause your water to smell phenols and stuff like that. That is what activated carbon does. Uh, now, if you're trying to keep, say, discus, and you're trying to keep high humid water uh, that mimics the water down in the Rio Negro, which, you know, Black River, that's down in South America, obviously you're not going to want to use activated carbon because it defeats the purpose that you're trying to do. So if you're buying that black water mix or, you know, there's different names for this stuff, you're going to want to make sure you don't have activated carbon in your system because it's going to remove the stuff that you're intentionally adding. Make sense, Hillary? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, there's, it, with all the things that I'm talking about today, there's always caveats depending upon the type of fish you're keeping and what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. What I'm talking about is good for 85, 90% of the people out there that just want a nice community tank, want uh, you know, clear, sparkling water, uh, then in, in you want to have, and nobody wants a smelly aquarium. That's one of the biggest complaints that people say, well, I always have to clean it. It looks dirty. The water's yellow and it smells. Well, you're probably overcrowding, overfeeding and not doing any maintenance. So you kind of, what do you expect? But activated carbon can help you. It's not a crutch or a uh, something, an alternative to water changes or cleaning your tank, but it can definitely help keep the water cleaner and healthier for your fish. Now, uh, I, I want to ask, because I, you know, it could be good, could be bad. People have different opinions. Um, is it one of the types of media that it's important to make sure you change it out? Does it have a specific timeline or lifetime? Yes, it does. The problem is you can't easily tell when it's no longer working. But there is a test. And what I'd say is tell people is you should, you know, kind of keep a log of, of your aquarium when you change things. Because when you have a problem and you email us, we're going to ask, when's the last time you changed your carbon? When's the last time you cleaned the tank? What did you do? So anyways, a quick, easy way to check your carbon is take a glass that you can see through uh, and fill it with aquarium water, put it down on a piece of white paper and look, look down from the top of the glass through the bottom. And now everyone has a camera, it's called your phone. Take a picture of that. 
And then once a week or so, repeat that. And you will notice over time, you're going to see that that water gets yellower and yellower. Is yellower a word? Eh, we just sure, made we'll, that up. We'll, 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 we'll go with it. <laughs> we'll make it a word for today. More yellow? <laughs> Anyways, the water is going, to, even though it can be clear, you know, there's no particles in it, it's going to become colored, yellow to brown. And you'll notice it. That's, and when that appears, that is when it's your carbon is no longer working and change it. Maybe 24 hours later, repeat the test and you'll see there's a big difference there. So that's the easiest way. Uh, there's companies out there that try to sell test kits. Uh, it's kind of the same thing or, or the only real way to know is a total organic carbon test and you don't need to go there. I mean, that's hundreds of dollars and you just don't need that. So how long your carbon's going to last is completely related to how much you feed and how much life is in your tank because life is putting out waste products, which is organics, which is being decayed and broken down by bacteria, producing these dissolved substances that tend to discolor water. If you've got uh, a brand new driftwood, I mean, some people want this, others don't, but a lot of times brand new driftwood into your tank will leach and it'll put a brown color. It'll discolor the water to a, to a brown color and people don't want that. Or leaves. I mean, why is the Rio Negro and, and other rivers uh, brown? Well, one thing you'll notice is there's a lot of organic material. That's, that's when the floods happen. There's two seasons, the rainy season and the dry season in most parts of South America during the the rainy season, the rivers overflow the, the smaller course into the, the forest and all that organic material, the leaves and the trunks of the trees and all that stuff is underwater and starts to decay, producing that yellow color, the humic acids. Um, the nice thing about humic acids is they're a way to prevent certain types of potentially pathogenic bacteria from growing, but they also tend to prevent the nitrifying bacteria from growing. So if you're using humic acids or trying to have a, a high humic content, really discolored brown you know, water to mimic something like a South American tank, be aware that your nitrifiers are gonna grow slower in that water and you might have a buildup of ammonia. But as everything is linked together, generally you're gonna find that your pH is low. The pH in, in South American waters is quite low. Those, those waters are also very soft. They don't have a lot of calcium and magnesium. Um, all traits that nitrifying bacteria don't like, we've covered this before, but that low pH keeps the total ammonia in the ammonium stage, which is the non-toxic stage. So you, you'll be okay, but realize that you probably aren't gonna be able to keep as many fish in a low pH, humic South American you know, environment biotome as you could in a high pH, clear water um, environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just my solution to that is you need a bigger tank. How about a pond? Ooh. You got now I mean you... you got 500 acres. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> mm. Does Miss Piggy want to go into uh, swimming a pond? I don't. Uh, he, he he's not a big fan of water. Like absolutely refuses to go near water for as much as pigs supposed to like water and rolling in mud. He does not. No. Okay, sensible pig. No mud. Okay, so. Uh, activated carbon. So you, you'll learn it with your system. Uh, the more food, the more animals, the shorter the time period it's going to last. I mean, you can, if you want to take out your carbon and put it in there just once in a while, that's fine. When you take it out, rinse it really well with clean 
butter to get all that organic material out of there and then let it dry and you, you can put it back in. There's no harm in doing that. Um, activated carbon, uh, you get kind of what you pay for. If, if, if it's really cheap, there's probably a reason. Uh, rinse it because when the carbon is being uh, shipped and moved, the granular uh, pieces rub against each other. And, and so you get fines or there's also compressed carbon. It's, it looks like little um, uh, you know, granules in, or uh, sticks, you know, fish, the little fish sticks you feed koi looks like oh, yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, that's small pieces of carbon that are pressed together. It can work okay. I prefer just good old granular activated carbon made by bituminous coal. Um, now, another type of, of media is, especially in saltwater tanks, is media to remove phosphate. People are always trying to control phosphate. And so there's phosphate removing media, which is generally either ferric oxide, which is orange in color and very heavy because ferric, that's iron, so it's iron oxide, or alumina oxide. Uh, which is white, uh, small, small beads. The alumina oxide works better in terms of you'll get more phosphate removal per gram than the ferric oxide, but of course it's much more expensive. And with both of those, again, you should pre-filter the water to remove organics you know, particulate organics from the water. And then uh, you can have activated carbon, then you can have the uh, phosphate removing material. And the, the phosphate removing material, it can only remove so many, you know, grams of phosphate per kilograms or milligrams of phosphate per gram of media uh, then, it, then it wears out. Um, now, how do you know? Well, when you measure your phosphate level before you add the media, add the media, let it work for 24, 48 hours, not five minutes. You know, it takes time for all of this to work. Um, measure your phosphate again, and it sh you know, the phosphate should be reduced. And measure it a couple of days and it'll go down pretty low. And now start maybe every four days, five days measuring it. And eventually you'll notice the phosphate starts to increase. And all things being equal, that tells you that the media is worn out. And uh, you really just need to, to, to exchange the media. Again, how long it's gonna last is pretty much directly related to how much you feed because that's your primary source of phosphate is your feed. The more you feed and the more what I call prepared, so flakes and pellets, they tend to be high in phosphate versus a frozen food with the caveat, big caveat here, you, if you're rinsing your frozen food, because the preservative agent of most frozen foods is phosphate. So if you're just taking that cube out and tossing it in the tank frozen and letting it uh, dissolve in the water and then the animals are eating it, you're actually adding a fair amount of phosphate to the water just because of the preservative agent in the frozen food. So uh, it's not a, a, I don't recommend, I recommend you rinse your frozen food it's that phosphate out of there, but not, I know a lot of people who don't do that. Now what, oh, um, some people, and we do, so we, our phosphate, we have phosphate eliminator, it's 100% aluminum oxide, but we also have phosphate eliminator plus, and where we combine the aluminum oxide with the ferric oxide, so it's a little less expensive, uh, works, I mean, it works fine. You're going to get, like I said, more bang for your buck with the FOSS eliminator. But, you know, there's price points for everybody. And uh, they work equally well in freshwater 
and salt water. And that's the same with the activated carbon. We make a, a product called uh, uh, Carbon Plus, and that is our carbon combined with our FOSS eliminator. So it's granule activated carbon mixed with the aluminum oxide because activated carbon does not remove phosphate. That is one of the elements or, or compounds that carbon does not remove. And in fact, some grades or so, some you know, brands of carbon can actually add phosphate to your aquarium because the way, one of the ways of quote activating, well, what does activated carbon mean? It means they take this organic material and they're trying to uh, generate a lot of pores, make it very porous so that you're getting that internal surface area. And one way to do that is to bathe the carbon material in phosphoric acid. And they don't rinse that. They don't leach it out and make sure that it's 100% phosphate free at the end. So you, you got to be careful. And, and one way to test that is take a teaspoon of your activated carbon and put it in you know a small shot glass of water or something like that, stir it up a little bit, let it sit for an hour or two and do a phosphate test. And if your phosphate test turns deep blue, you know that the brand of carbon that you're buying is actually adding phosphate to the aquarium. And if that's a concern to you, then you'd want to consider switching to another brand. Yep. Um, so we've got, uh, and why use one, why use the other? You know, the activated carbon with or without the phosphor eliminator, a 100% phosphor eliminator mix. It kind of depends on your system and on your budget. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that it can, it can, you know, cost some money to, to run your aquarium. And, it, and if you've got a reef system and you're really uh, trying to manage phosphate, then it's and you and also surface you know, or, or space you don't have a lot of space for all this type of media in your system then running uh, the aluminum oxide material is probably going to be better for you even though it's initially more expensive it's going to remove more phosphate and take less space than some of the other choices that are in there but in in all cases as I've mentioned, you know, pre-filter, get the particulate material out, and then realize they don't work forever. And so you want to you want to maintain them and clean them. Sometimes it's as you, you can just see the top surf, wherever the water's entering your media, uh, that becomes very clogged up. And, and that brings up another point is what do you put these in? I mean, our media generally comes with a bag. And if you look closely, the bag, we sell two different pore sizes, 300 micron opening and a thousand micron opening. Because you, just like I've been talking about, pore size is really important. If it's too small, the water can't get in or it quickly becomes clogged. Many of these media, almost all of them, are, are you place them in a bag or they come in a bag because they just you just don't want to have it loose along the bottom of the aquarium. But if you just put it in a very small bag, that the pores, the bag itself is going to become slimed up and the water's going to go around it. Think about your aquarium system. We're not pushing the water through these media like a sand filter in an aquarium in a pool or something like that, pushing or pulling it. We're putting it in the path of the water and basically hoping, is that a good enough term there? Hope, hoping the water goes through. Wishing and hoping. Wishing and hoping. <laughs> and, and I've talked about that with biological media where people, you know, you just put it on the bottom of the sump and then hope it goes through, but that's just not going to happen. When I was at Marine Land, you know, if, if you look at the, the, hang on the tank filters, um, the media is vertical. You know, you've got that filter pad 
that's why that's first the blue fuzzy pad and then there were inside that we had shelves where the carbon or whatever media were in those pads would be sitting so that the water has to come in contact it wasn't just a bag with all the carbon at the bottom the why is the water going to dive into that carbon it's not water is always going to take the path of least resistance so you need to put um you need to, to, to make sure the water can't just bypass all your media or you're wasting your time. So, tr so use the, a bag with the biggest pore openings that you can find for the media, like our biological filter media. I mean, that's, you know, big size, half inch or so uh, pieces. And that you want a big bag, whereas the FOSS eliminators are very small media and so it's got to go in that 300 micron bag. But if you take the bag out and it's brown, it just a quick rinse or, you know, with a brush, brush that bag, clean that ex, the exterior of the bag off. And, and I prefer, if you can, to kind of hang the bag into the water. I mentioned this about filter, or biological filter media, making a wall. Try to basically make the water go through it. Just throwing the media in a corner and hoping isn't much of a filtration strategy. Uh, and, and that brings up canister filters. Um, canister filters are very popular. So I talked about a hang on the tank. The water is sucked into the filter and then basically pushed out one part of the filter into the filter box. The, tank, the filter box is above the tank hanging. That's why they're called hang on the tank. It's hanging over the lip of the tank. When the filter box fills up, it then by gravity just spills back into the tank, except for poorly manufactured ones where the filter media clogs up and the water spills out the back of the filter box onto your floor. Oh no. Oh yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So a canister filter is supposedly uh, is not having that problem. It's a sealed canister, a sealed chamber where the water is, is being pushed out, but you're creating a siphon. So the water is, is in, a, in a tube. One tube is, is the inlet. So it's being siphoned out of the tank and a pump is pushing the water back into the aquarium and that causes kind of a filter or a siphon and a sucking action where the water comes into the canister and has you know the idea is it has to go through the media and a good canister filter what's going to happen is the flow rate over time back into the aquarium is going to be reduced and it's going to get less and less and if you don't maintain the filter it's going to become zero why because the mechanical portion of that canister filter is completely solidly clogged and the filter isn't strong enough to suck the water through the media. You then have to take the canister filter apart and clean it. So they can be really good. Um, but some canister filters, you know, first when I joined the aquarium industry, this one store owner said, oh, I love this brand of filter because you never have to clean it. Well, if you never have to clean your canister filter, that means your canister filter is not filtering. So it's basically a fancy water pump. You have to clean your filter. If your filter isn't, it never becomes clogged. Uh, it's not doing you or your fish or corals or anything else any good. Um, so uh, now what's happening though in, I talked about under gravel filters because a lot of people want to do, you know, biological filter and they'll put the bio, my biological filter media for the nitrifiers is in my canister, which, it, which is fine with, again, you've got to make sure you've got water running through that filter and you should have a pre-filter, a sponge on the inlet or the first thing the water should see is some type of a, a mechanical filter to remove that particulate material. But that means that your canister filter is going to clog and the water flow through the biological media is going to be reduced over time. 
which means that you need to clean that canister filter on a regular basis to make sure that the water is going through the media. Because if it isn't going through the media, it's not working. So there's, there's no free lunch here. Um, and uh, you know it's it's not that difficult and i've got an article you know because people say what's the best filter the best filter for you is the one that you understand how it works and you know how to clean it and you're willing to take the time you know it's if, you're if, willing to take the time i feel like that's the key part of that it is the key part <laughs> if ah yeah, that's a pain. I'm going to put it off until the weekend. The weekend's here. Uh, I'm going to the park. It's sunny outside. It's a beautiful day. I'll get to that Monday or Tuesday. Oh, work was terrible today. I'm dead tired. I'll get to it next weekend. Yeah. If you're not willing to clean it. It's not very effective. No. You have to be willing to clean it. And so, you know, a, a, a hang on the take filter, which you know, it's, it may not cost a lot, but, but it can be very effective because, okay, I to take the, the filter pad out that has the mechanical and the chemical, has my activated carbon, I throw it away and I put a new one in, I'm done. You cleaned it. You know, you know, I got to say, like my tanks that I, my temporary tanks that I have right now, they're both running hang on back filters and like, they're very easy, very easy to clean. And I love yeah. it for everything else that I don't love. The filter part is really easy right now. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's there's uh, we we made the emperors, which had a um, a fun this, little bio wheel thing on them. Well, it had more than a bio wheel. It, you know, it's it's put put your work where your mouth is. The first thing was a fuzzy pad. The water went through a fuzzy pad, and then there was a second reusable cartridge, a clamshell that you could open up. And you could put carbon, you could put zeolite, we're going to talk about that, you could put the fossil eliminator, you could put any media you wanted in there. After the fuzzy pad, which was the mechanical, then you put your clamshell chemical, and then you had the, the bio wheel, which was a self cleaning, a rotating biological contactor, RBC, you can look it up. It's the most efficient type of biological filtration because it's self cleaning. The, the action of the wheel going through the water keeps the uh, pore, the, the pores, the surface clean. It doesn't allow the buildup of organics on the biofiltration media. They work great. And they yep. last forever. That was the problem. People would throw their bio wheel away. Why? Because it was getting them brown and dirty looking. Yeah, that's all the biological filter media. That's the bacteria colony that you just tossed out. Um, I, I knew I might be using mine for during this travel and move. So I had the, the wheels just like sitting in the sump, like hanging out so that they could, you know, get all cooked and good bacteria so that when I put them in the temporary tank and got it up and running. Yeah, and if, if you do shows, you know, end of the month, the American Cichlid Association, American Live Bear Association, all, you know, a couple other clubs are all descending upon Louisville. It's going to be freshwater fish heaven. Um, and, and I'll be there. Um, and, you know, if you're showing, there's going to be a fish you know, contest showing your fish. Why not have a bio wheel that has the bacteria? It's a portable biological filter. And all you need to do is something like that. And, and flow disclosure, I don't sell bio wheels. We don't make bio wheels anymore. So we're not trying to sell you bio wheels, but it's a great invention. Um, you can put it in a plastic bag. As long as it's moist, it doesn't have to be underwater. Um, it transports easy. And then you set up the tank and boom, you've got instant biological filter no stress for your fish. So nope. we digress, <laughs> <laughs> which is not unusual. No, I feel like it's probably expected right now. You know, actually funny, I was saving this, but there was a YouTube comment like, please digress and go down the rabbit hole. We're totally okay with that. We want to hear you go more in depth on stuff. So people support it. I'm just saying. Okay. Well, we've been yakking for, oh my gosh, it's been an hour. Haven't we? almost 50, I don't know 50 like, minutes it doesn't matter we're continuing <laughs> on <laughs> but um so so there's other types of filtration media uh chemical filtration media and one of them is zeolite we our product is zeal pure zeolite 
is a natural clay-based material. It's a type of uh, you know, zeolite. The material is called clinoptilolite, which is a type of zeolite. And it has the propensity to remove ammonia from water. So it's a great way of doing some ammonia control, but it's not a replacement for a biological filter. And that's for two reasons. One, the harder the, your water, so the more calcium in the mag or more magnesium, the less efficient the zeolite is. And also zeolite pretty much doesn't work in salt water due to the high amount of sodium. And let's go down. If somebody wanted us to go down the rabbit hole, let's venture down the rabbit hole for a second, Hillary. How does this work? So zeolites work by ion exchange, which is different than activated carbon. Activated carbon works by ad, AD, adsorption, not absorption. Absorption is like a sponge. It sucks up the water, you squeeze the sponge and the water comes back out. Adsorption is there's a weak chemical attraction and a weak chemical bonding of the material, the organic compound that is dissolved in the water that the activated carbon removes. And, and you can remove lots of substances. As I said, I've got an article that goes through all this. And the only way to get that back in the case of activated carbon, depending on what you're trying to maybe get back if you wanted to, is that you need to change the pH to a very low level, like two, or a very high level above 12. And that's not your fish tank because a lot of people say, well, once the activated carbon becomes full, it starts releasing everything. And the answer to that is no, it doesn't. Uh, you have to chemically change the water and that is primarily the pH of the water and your fish couldn't live uh, in the pH that you need to recover what was adsorbed to your activated carbon. Now, zeolites work in a different way and that's called ion exchange. Remember we have ions, they can be a cation, that's a positive charged ion, or an anion, that's a negative charged anion. So in the case of ammonia, ammonia ammonium, NH4 plus, well, the zeolite will, likes to remove cations. And it, but for every one cation or a cation with a plus one that it removes, it's going to put another type of cation back into the water. That's the exchange. It's taking one out, it's putting one in. So why is the efficiency of it reduced as the water gets harder? What is water hardness? Calcium and magnesium. What is calcium? Ca2 plus, magnesium, Mg2 plus. Two is bigger than one. N8 ammonium is only one. So the zeolite wants to remove the calcium and the magnesium before it wants to basically remove or exchange the ammonia. So as your water gets harder, it, less ammonia is going to be removed. And what's in salt water, salt, sodium, one plus, Na plus, but there's a uh, literally a ton of sodium, not literally, but, but there's, a, there's a lot of sodium in salt water, so much that the exchange process is preferential to the sodium and not to the ammonium. And that's why zeolites don't work at removing ammonium when you get in hard or salty water. Let's get out of the rabbit hole. How's that, Hillary? All right. But I do like explaining the reasons why. I mean, there's biological and chemical reasons why these things do what they do. All this media, all this stuff that we're using is taken from the water treatment, water reuse. It's taken from some professional field. There's, there's science there. 
some companies want you not to know the science or understand the science, but that's not us. We want you to understand if you wish um, what's the going on. The more you understand, the more successful you'll be. And we want you to be successful. Well, yeah, that, the whole goal is to be successful, have fun. Nobody gets a fish tank because they want more work. I need more work in my life. Let's get a fish tank. Uh, <laughs> no. If you want enjoyment, you want it to be nice, and you want it to be a pleasurable experience, and we, we do too. That's why we're in this. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we can do the science, and we appreciate you listening to it. But if you don't want to um, take part in that, that's okay. Use our products and enjoy yourself. We try to make this easy and make it fun at the same time. Um, so I think that covers kind of the major uh, different types of media and to review your chemical media should come after your biological media. Uh, now, you know, the order I would put activated carbon first before any of the different types of media. Do you have to run any of these? The answer is no. It all depends upon the amount of fish and the amount of feeding that you're doing because generally it's the organics that are uh, ca causing filtration problem, causing your biological filter not to work or making the tank dirty, smelly, and um, coloring. So don't overcrowd and don't overfeed goes a long ways. So use quality media and change it on a, a regular schedule and uh, you should be good to go. I like that. Simple. Yeah. All right, everyone. So I, that's been a brief recap. You know, we're doing questions and answers next week. Um, if you've got them, I think Hillary's got some going on. We had a lot last time and we didn't yep. get to them all, um, but we love hearing questions and answers. Um, I'll be at the big uh, ACA, American Signal Association meeting at Louisville at the end of the month. And then we've got Palooza, California. We've also got Aquashella in Texas. There are a ton of events and yes. haven't even mentioned the reptile stuff. Oh my gosh, yes. yes. Just, it's gonna be a crazy fall, crazy. Yeah starting at the end of july it's gonna be nuts yeah lots of fun so uh check our uh social media and yep. uh it talks about all these different things that are going on and uh because i know there's another reptile show in daytona beach there's a reptile show in uh schaumburg plus like i said aquashella in, in texas and aquashella in Chicago and Reefa Palooza. So and Magna, crazy. everything. Oh, and, oh yeah, don't forget Magna. Magna's coming to Milwaukee the second weekend. Oh, maybe the first weekend. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, Magna in, in Milwaukee. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have a, a booth there. So come uh, out and you, say hi. You know what I'm looking forward to at Magna? <laughs> this is a terrible reason to look forward to the show, but jason langer he's the guy that makes the cookies and decorates them like ornately decorates them to look like fit like real fish right that's his local show and he's going to be there and i'm super excited i can't wait to see what cookies he's got this year <laughs> wonderful mm. yep mm. pieces of wor works of art that you consume you know, he, he gave me a whole box of cowfish cookies last year. So I ate one or two and I have one saved so that I can always enjoy it and appreciate it. There you go. <laughs> I do have a question before we go. Sure. If you are a reptile person and you're listening to this podcast, please, please, please send us a message, um, either a DM on our Instagram or a Facebook page or send an email to the info um, email. Let us know if that's some content that you would be interested in hearing, and we'll give you some more information with um, our reptile side of stuff. Yeah, reptilesystems.com. Yep. All right. All right. And a little bit of a teaser. We're going to have some real cool aquatic stuff from our uh, partners 
ASF here in about six to eight weeks. Wee, I'm so excited. The unveiling at Magna. <gasps> gonna be cool. yes, so. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, that's it. We're not going to tell anybody anymore. You're going to have to. You're going to have to follow us. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. This has been Dr. Tim and Hillary. Another session of Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast. Have fun out there, folks. Thank you.